So uh, my name is Lindsay Grace. As I mentioned, I am an associate professor, and I like to stand um, in games. So I'll just talk kind of from my perspective as a new media artist without blocking a lot here. OK, so I uh, think I'm going to have to do it the old-fashioned way by doing this or not. Don't worry. Everything's cool. All right. Ah, try that. Yeah, we're good. OK, great. So as I mentioned, uh, I direct the game lab. And so a lot of what I'm going to talk about is actually how we integrate the sort of now into, uh, into games. So I've been teaching uh, new media for about 11 years now. Uh, and a lot of what I'm going to talk about is uh, just my overall overarching heuristics, the lessons I've learned as I've done this sort of thing. So uh, I've taught 83 courses over that time. And they've been a pretty wide range to understand where I'm coming from. Everything from things like script writing for film to 3D modeling and uh, mobile game marketing, et cetera. So um, I've got this wide range, and you can, you can always go to my website and see the kinds of courses that I've taught. But um, the reason I give that is because I want to sort of tell you what I know about how current topics have worked in these environments. 
So um, as I kind of view them, current topics really do give students a sense of meaning. So it resonates with them and it gives them a reason to sort of say, well, I really want to do this project not because it's a, an assignment, but because I think this thing matters. It's about the now, right? Um, and what I'm learning matters. This is one of the tricks that I do for students who are doing things like, um, I teach a lot of what we call meaningful play or persuasive play, which can often to some people seem like it's, uh, it's burdensome. I have to teach people things. But if they're excited about that topic, if it's something contemporary, it tends to motivate them. Uh, current, current topics also help people feel connected to the world. Um, so the, uh, the thing I, I often thought, particularly when I was dealing with students who are almost getting out of school, ready to get their first job, is they wanted something that helped them understand how they could succeed outside the academic environment. And so I always sort of you know, show something like this where well, they're thinking that small scale in the classroom, but what the current topics do is they sort of bring them out at least nationally, if not internationally. Um, that's just a blank slide. Uh, and so one of the things is, you know, it's sort of this idea of getting people to think of themselves as part of a larger group and how are they participating in that conversation, what are they generating. I have a lot of artists and a lot of students who are producing um, items, uh, and so the idea is that they that see the, the contemporary and current topics as a sort of a first step. I also um, really like to give students a sense of ownership, which I think current topics do, um, current events do, uh, and <coughs> allow students to think critically uh, about the world as an evolving space. So I often sort of use this analogy uh, that it's kind of a, a series of intersections, right? So we can have long conversations in class about why this particular event erupted or happened, if it's something of conflict or something of, of national interest. And so we often talk about this sort of intersection and what, what happened. Was it a, a confluence of technology and social standards or something else? Uh, and then just a quick example from case studies that I've done uh, in classes. So uh, one thing I think is interesting, and it's sort of a pitch, I apologize, but I have to pitch this. So um, we just started something called the Jill Fellowship. So uh, the Knight Foundation gave us $250,000 to um, understand and examine how uh, the intersection of journalism and game design thinking work. And so these students will be doing just that. It'll be news and how we can intersect that with games. Uh, and think beyond sort of what we call news games, uh, so converting news material into some kind of playable experience. And more widely, uh, we're thinking about how we can change the way people consume and produce news and current events via, uh, via game strategies. So use those engagement technologies, et cetera. And then a, a sort of systems design approach. Uh, so that's that. Uh, the other thing that I've you know, in the last year been talking a lot about is diversity in games. For those of you who don't know a lot about the games industry, uh, there's been a lot of chatter in the last year about the lack of diversity. Um, a lot of sort of, a, it, you know, it fits into what some people think of as a stereotype of gamers. Um, so there weren't enough women participating in the industry, even though they're about 48% of the consumer market. Uh, as well, there were not enough minorities. So a lot of people are talking about this and um, from a wide range of uh, news outlets. And uh, one of the things that sort of precipitated from this is this, uh, and I'm gonna talk very briefly about it, but this thing called Gamergate, which was a hashtag, a very hate-filled hashtag that was um, largely misogynistic, so it was against women, it was against minorities, uh, and there was a lot of back and forth about, um, their, their initial claim was that they were interested in game journalism, but realistically it was just sort of that old hate-mongering that we've seen in other industries. Uh, and so what we did in sort of response to that is we created this diversity summit where we brought a bunch of students in as a kind of co-curricular uh, in order to um, really just have a, a lively conversation about what we can do to affect diversity um, from the inside and from the outside. And then that Gamergate also precipitated things like this uh, research project for one of my graduate students uh, where she was trying to find a way to understand the now by looking at historical context. So she looked at the um, changes in um, Title IX uh, for uh, players of professional sports and how the reaction to that change um, as a, a political force affected or is similar to the way that Gamergate has played out. And then lastly, as a sort of an example, uh, so the Dalai Lama, when I was teaching at Miami University, uh, came in uh, to visit the university and, and do his thing. And he, you know, he puts on his hat and says, you know, yay, Miami. Uh, and one of the things that he, uh, what happened was that a really, you know, the students were excited about this. This is a big event for this small town in Cincinnati. And so um, students started creating a bunch of these games. So this game is about, um, uh, sort of Buddhist philosophy, and uh, you're trying to ascend, and you can do things. It's called karma. You can actually thwart other people, but it always comes back to get you. And it's a board game. It's really sort of an interesting uh, mechanic. And it was because they were excited about it, right? I could never have said, okay, I need you to do a game on karma. But because Dalai Lama was coming, people were like, well, you know what? I'm actually really interested in this thing. Uh, and then, you know, there's obviously, uh, I can tell you what I'm going to touch on this semester, uh, because it's particularly resonant for games. Um, so uh, that's all I have. That's my fault. <laughs>
Well, think about we baby the boomers see. don't travel with our phones. <gasps> so. <laughs> <laughs> so here we go, Marta. Okay. So uh, my name is Margo. Suspect can call me Margo. My students do, even though some of the freshmen and sophomores tend to get a little terrified when I say that to them. Like, oh my god, um, they find it impossible to. So wait for the slide to come up. Did something get knocked out? Yeah. yeah. Sorry. It's a current event thing. It's cool. It happens all the time. <laughs> <laughs> I kind of need it up there. I kind of like a punchline. <laughs> Maybe. Talk amongst yourselves. I'll give you a topic. <laughs> the peanut. What was the hashtag again on Twitter? Teaching the now. Teaching the now. Okay, so you were. Yeah, there's just like a ton of boards. I'm sorry about that. Yeah, that's just trying okay. to not die. <laughs> Try not to die. Okay. Yeah. That's good advice for a Friday <laughs> afternoon. Yeah, great. So um, I am a professor, professorial lecturer in journalism, and I've been teaching, this is now my ninth year, <coughs> teaching. Uh, I was at two universities in Florida. This is my second year here at AU. So I've taught everything from reporting to journalism ethics, mass media and society, public speaking and writing. So I can hear what you're saying and you're, what you're thinking is this little asterisk here, which is no blank, Margo. Of <laughs> course you're going to use current events when you teach journalism. <laughs> it would be ridiculous, right? And of course, I mean, I use everything, how I use examples for a reporting class would be different than how I might use it even for an advanced reporting class or how I would use it for an ethics class. But what I want you to think about today is that all of what I'm talking about today and all of the examples that I use in my journalism classes or my mass media and society classes, I'm teaching a comm studies class this semester, um, would be applicable to any field, really. Business and industry, you could say. Um, legal issues, lots of legal issues come up, unfortunately, um, in the ethics class. Um, political science, government, international affairs, gender, race, and society. So it's not just that this is a talk for journalists, and I don't want you to think that I'm just up here, you know, just talking about what it is that I do in my class, and of course you'll figure out how to do it in your class, right? But, mm -hmm. okay, so who wants to read this first sentence for me? This is really the aim of my discussion today, and really the aim of how I use current events in my classes. So may I have a volunteer, Lynn Perry. Okay, and now a sec, sorry Lynn, feeling the need, the pressure, and a, a second volunteer for my second sentence. Short. Through understanding current events as rooted in history and culture, how can students improve their own media and political literacy? So really these are the two aims for me, is I, I don't assume that any of my students have the level of media literacy that I have. I mean, I have a doctorate in mass communication, I'm married to a journalist, most of my friends are journalists, I went to Columbia Journalism School. I don't expect that students have the same education system that I did, I don't expect that they have the same media literacy or political literacy that I have. So when I'm giving any lecture and bringing in current events, I have to understand and try to get that across to them. I'm trying to increase their media literacy and their political literacy as well, right? Is that going to work for every student? No. Is every student, is there a homogenous group of students that I teach? Of course not. But I really want them to feel like they have a voice in the process and to understand that current events aren't just, you know, a flash on their Facebook feed or like one Twitter hashtag, with no offense to Twitter hashtag. <laughs> We have one here, um, but really to try to understand that these are rooted in, in culture. And one of my favorite examples that I use, have used in my writing classes, my public speaking classes, and in my ethics classes um, is actually a case that's um, more than 100 years old. And I'll talk about that in just a second. So this has implications in many of the classes that I've taught. And you haven't only known me now for about three and a half minutes, but what would you say are the implications here? Or what field would this be applicable to? And I, this is what I do. I put up a slide like this in my class and we talk about it for like 30 minutes. This is how I use PowerPoint, so. <laughs> what are the fields that could deal with this? Yeah. Crisis comms. Ooh, crisis, okay, good, love it. What else? Sociology. Sociology, what else? Well, the ethics of needing to be first and wrong. Okay, absolutely, right? That we're going to balance this need to be first, and we're going to give up a lot of accuracy. So certainly my reporting students, this is a cautionary tale. 
And my ethics students have something to learn from this, certainly, right? And you don't have to know much about the Boston Marathon bombing to know that this was that this was wrong. The New York Post actually just settled a major libel lawsuit for also putting on their front page um, the photo of two um, two young men in Boston with the headline "Bag Men," um, and those two young men who they, the New York Post, implicated as the two perpetrators of the violence were in fact just two innocent bystanders. And that, li that libel lawsuit was just settled in October or November. So lots to talk about, legal implications, right? You could bring this into a, you know, as you said, you know, sociology class. I mean, this is fascinating here. Um, I did use, I was teaching ethics at Florida State University um, when this happened. I used to live in Boston. So um, and thankfully, one of, our, one of my close friends from Florida had just crossed the finish line right before this happened. Um, and so once we could figure out what the real, you know what the real toll was um, that the New York Post was wrong, but you know there was in fact a human toll here. Um, you know I like to talk to my students about what went right in the reporting as journalists. Certainly they have to report on this, and ob you know tragedy unfortunately is is going to come into their work. Um, the use of photography here is this the right photo to use? Right? What do you think? Would you have run this photo? Pretend you're an editor. Who says yes? 30 years of newsroom experience, okay. Who says no? Who's not voting? Yeah. <laughs> okay. Describe exactly what, is it two bystanders? Oh, I'm sorry, it's, I thought you could tell person. what it was. It's, um, it is a picture of a person on the ground and there, there's blood all over. It's the scene of one of the two bombs that went off um, on Boylston Street that day. So it's just kind of a lot of blood, a lot of gore, um, and <laughs> the fact that it's a six, you know, it's a six strap, right? When, how many columns is that? Six, yeah. eight, yeah, it's a, it's a lot of space there. Um, the use of the word terror, some students have critiqued. Um, so, but we'll, we'll have other examples to, to talk about. Mainly, I think this is one of those. Um, Rolling Stone cover, I know we had just moved to Washington, D.C. last summer when this ran and I was pushing my daughter was so hot I had no idea what else to do with, rather than just walk around Union Station which is three blocks from my house in the air conditioning and I remember seeing this on a newsstand and like fumbling like oh my like nearly tripping pushing the stroller I couldn't I, I was so shocked as a person who has studied journalism mass media and society that Rolling Stone would devote this kind of space to this person alleged uh, bomber you know, in a place that's normally reserved for pop culture icons. And as a person who also, my specialty is adolescent and children media, uh, I was really shocked by what this was telling youth about, you know, this kind of doe-eyed, messy-haired, bedhead picture. Um, Kelly McBride, famous ethicist, or, you know, very popular ethicist with Pointer, um, you know, would disagree with me on this point. She would say that he has reserved this space um, from being in culture. but. This is not just a conversation about ethics. How else, law or political science, do you think, could you use this right now? I don't understand the question. You mean how would you? How else could you use this if you were teaching law or if you were teaching even sociology right now, this week? I know well, I mean, someone's I was, reading. Me. I happen to be a lawyer. Yeah. So I was okay. Law, I would question the accuracy. I mean, so first of all, are the things they're saying about him true? Okay. Um, you know, was he a popular, promising student who failed with fail by his family, et cetera, et cetera? Okay. Um, and then the other thing is, um, you know, he just just the, the, the way he's being depicted as a rock star. So this is now three years old. I would <laughs> want to say this now. If, if I perhaps, I know, know you can't read my mind in my abbreviated version of, of this lecture. And I would use it this week if I were teaching, yeah related to speech I, I mean I also so I think it's, it's related to speech and directly related this week because you know there's the backlash right everyone is now standing up for the free speech rights of, of the, the Charlie Hebrew uh, paper right so then it's, you can make the same argument here where there's a lot of cultural backlash against Rolling Stone doing this but then going back to the First Amendment and their rights it's the same type of cultural backlash that's happening but the opposite the opposite sentiment Okay, I absolutely agree with you. I have no Boston Globe readers in the room. 
No. What's going on this week related? Yeah. They're the yeah, they're choosing the jury right now in Boston, right? I mean, this is a major event in Boston, not to mention hashtag 2024 that Boston is trying to go for an Olympic bid. They're choosing the jury, right? They got the bid. I'm sorry? Oh, they got the bid? They got the U.S. Oh, the U.S. bid. Yeah, I mean, it I mean, this hasn't gone internationally. But what, what I also think is fascinating about this, having lived in Boston, I have so many friends in Boston, as I mentioned before, is that he did not get a change of venue, um, you know, agreed to. So if I'm a lawyer, or if I'm teaching a law class, I mean, that's a fascinating way to use current events to discuss that, if it's something that I can use. Right, to me, there's no way this guy's getting a fair trial in Boston. I mean, I, I'm not, you know, you can say what you want about terrorism or whatever happens, but there's no way they're picking an impartial jury of 12 men and women for this guy. There's just no way it's happening. And this is how I'm using this cover this week. Different than how I would have used it six months ago, different than how I would have used it when it first came out in 2013, right? So just things that you can think about. How can I get students to talk about it? Students are dying to talk about current events. They are dying to talk about the stuff that just hits them over and over and over again. And one of the things that I would just remind you is that you're in charge, right? You steer the ship. My students might want to talk about Tsarnaev for an hour and 15 minutes, but maybe I only have five or six or seven minutes to devote to it. Right? So you've got to be the one. What's the goal of what I want to do with this picture or this image or this story? What am I trying to link it to? And then be the one that directs the conversation. I'll let them talk a little bit, but then I have to make sure that I get the lesson in. And it might differ depending on, of course, as I mentioned before, what class that I'm teaching. Another thing I love to talk to students about are things called pseudo events. My public relations colleagues or crisis communications colleagues um, have probably a different take on these than I would as a journalist, right? As a reporting, um, a person who reports, my husband is actually covering this. Now, 2012, what's the historical context of Hurricane Sandy from a political perspective? From a political perspective. Right before the election. Right before the election, right? A close election. Now you have to be thinking if you're Barack Obama's team, Hurricane Sandy comes right before the election in 2012, that it is like a Hail Mary pass has just landed in your arms in the end zone. Why? Because you have the opportunity to spread your face all over this affected area and hug people, right? Oh, I love Obama, right? Okay, well that's great. You can love Obama, you can hate Obama. I don't really care in my classes whether or not you do. We're gonna talk about this from the perspective of He's got unlimited media attention right before a really close election. And that's amazing for him. And that's going to, and likely would, I can't wait to see the studies on it, have a huge effect on the election. Right, there's, no, there's just no question in my mind. So then we can talk about, well, wow, Obama's not the only one who does this, right? We have lots of cases where politicians do things in front of a staged event or a staged audience to try to influence the process, right? As a reporting professor, I'm going to teach this differently than an ethics professor. I was a double major in journalism, political science. As an undergrad, I would look at this in a certain way as a political science professor. Maybe if I'm a PR professor, I'm teaching this as what you should be doing, landing on an aircraft carrier to announce the end of a war. <laughs> it really isn't over nine years later, right? And then we can talk about, right, a time when these kids weren't even alive. I know I gave a reference to the show Cheers, and I got a bunch of, like, blank stares. It's like, oh, my goodness gracious. So do they even know who Michael Dukakis is? Gosh, I'm not even sure that they do. 1984, right? So we can talk about pseudo-events when pseudo-events go wrong, right? Not everyone in my class wants to be a journalist. Not everyone in my class wants to be, a, you know, an ethicist. Some of them want to be PR professionals. So maybe they take away this example where Dukakis ended up looking completely foolish and media attention just sucked away from him, right? Maybe they look at this and say, this is as my three-year-old would say, X, this is an X mom, this is what's not to do, right? Don't get in a tank and put on a helmet that is too big for you. And if you're planning advance work for a politician, this is a lesson in what not to do, right? We also look at what not to do. As much as I want to teach my students in any class how to do something correctly, how to do it according to an industry standard, there are lots of times when current events come into play where I want to show them this is what not to do. Always telling them that this is my perspective gained from my years of professional experience, academic experience, and my own social networks, my own you know, prism of experience and education. Um, in this case, you can remember after the Virginia Tech shooting, 
where 30, more than 30 people were killed. This guy had sent his manifesto to NBC, who chose to publish it. The Palm Beach Post, which was the paper I was reading in South Florida at the time, published this huge picture, literally like, went out to the driveway, got the paper, and it was like, opened it up, you know, kind of still tired, and like, bang, there he was, like right in the front of the paper. Oh man, wish I'd known I was going to be teaching ethics at the time because that was like, I would have saved it. it. It was like an assault. It was like being assaulted again, right? And I always tell my students, like, bring your voice to these meetings, right? Bring voice when you're the person making the decisions, because in 10 years you will be. They never believe me, but you will be. In 10 years or 15 years or 20 years, you want to be the one at the table that says, hey, wait a minute, are you sure? Like, are we doing it right? Should we send out that tweet? Should we use this picture? Right, lots of things to talk about. This is the Virginia Tech paper, and this was their front page the day after the shooting. And I think to me, and I always use this example in reporting and in ethics in my writing classes, this was a much more appropriate front page. Right, and you can say, well, there's no, more, no such thing as a front page in a few years, I'll have to change my example, you can come and see me then. But to me, this was much more effective rather than as the Hartford Current and the Washington Post and the New York Times showed all these like bloody bodies. This to me said so much more, right? And it was much more connected to a local audience than the way other news organizations ran what they ran, right? And again, it's not just journalism or ethics, but this is, you know, a local community story, you know, I think. And I thought that one was really heartbreaking. So my favorite example from history, the Triangle Shirtwaist Factory Fire, which I love to talk about, and I talk about it in different ways depending on um, which class I'm teaching. And this is an example from uh, New York City, and Ken, the Ken Burns documentary in New York talks about it extensively. And this is a wonderful example, and if you can show apart a clip from Ken Burns' documentary, students are jaw agape. 100 year old event and they love it they love learning about it most of them have never heard about it before and it gets again for me reporting we read the news coverage of it ethics they show bodies right we talked about 9 11 we've talked about some of the ethical coverage of some of the photos um, but it also is an example to talk about women's rights to talk about factory rights and students have no idea that this event that happened more than 100 years ago where all these women most of them immigrant teenagers died were rooted in what gave women the right to vote which changed factory and labor laws all across the country no idea whatsoever right so i can bring in a picture from virginia tech or from the boston marathon and say well let's look at 100 years ago what happened and all of a sudden in 30 minutes they've learned something they never knew about women's rights and labor rights. And that's great, you know? Hopefully they go home on Sunday night, they talk to their moms and dads and say, you'll never believe this. Have you ever heard of the Triangle Shirtwaist Factory fire? I hope they do, I don't know. Okay, so one last point I just wanna talk about. I need a, this is very relevant right now. This is a current event related to how I talk about current events. I need a volunteer to read this quote from Doug Marlette. Lynn Perry, no cheating on this one. Go ahead. Free speech, free speech is the linchpin of our republic. All other freedoms flow from it. After all, we don't need a First Amendment to allow us to run boring, inoffensive cartoons. We need constitutional protection for our right to express unpopular views. I promise you I planned this presentation before what happened in Paris, and it is, you certainly can look at it through that prism now. But I show this slide and talk to my students, and what do you think their reaction would be? Or what would your reaction be? Right, discussion here of the First Amendment, we need to protect right speech that's not always popular. What's your reaction? Just tell me what your reaction is to this to this one line. Very Western focused. Okay, Western focused. No one else has an opinion on the First Amendment. Mm -hmm. Well, I always immediately think about the hate speech issue. And oh, okay. Tension. Okay, tension, thank you. You're actually a little bit ahead of where my college sophomores are, so you're giving it a little bit away. But most cases, when I show this up on the screen, my college sophomores say, free speech, First Amendment, this is America, great. I do get some people who look at it through the guise of Western civilization, which is fine, right? And then I show them this cartoon, which was a cartoon that the Tallahassee Democrat, or Lynn Swart, that's why I said no cheating from her, Doug Marlette was, and he's now dead, but a North Carolina-based political cartoon. This ran in the Tallahassee Democrat. Um, and as you can imagine, there was a firestorm. 
So now students start to think about, well, wait a second, whoa. Right, they'd have to think about satire. We talk about The Daily Show, we talk about satire, and now, unfortunately, I have Charlie Hebdo to talk about as well, right? Are we as a culture intelligent enough to get satire anymore? Should we? Should news organizations be the ones pushing the envelope? Should they be the ones making us have these conversations? Should universities be the ones making us have these conversations? Students are dying to talk about it. They want to know, especially here at AU, they want to know that their voice is being heard, right? Now, invariably, uh, I will have students of Muslim descent, Jewish descent, Christian descent, and no religious affiliation descent. So again, when these guys, if you're going to use current events in your class, and you're going to use this one, or you're going to use show the cartoons from Charlie Hebdo, then you'd better be ready for what can be very, very intense, personal conversation that you will become more of a moderator. Um, and I will say here at AU, um, different than some of the other schools I've taught, the conversations tend to stay very civil, um, but they'll be talking about them. I'm still getting emails from this past semester when I taught ethics. So, okay. <coughs> My tips for you, use visuals, use clips like The Daily Show. They love The Daily Show, and now John Oliver, who is on HBO, is doing some incredible work in areas of media ownership, ethics, commercialization, <laughs> Lots and lots of stuff. I mean, I love John Oliver and The Daily Show, Colbert, I'm going to miss a lot. The other thing I want to say is use real experts. We all think of ourselves, for those of you who do teach in the room, as the experts in our area. But this is where I exploit my former colleagues, my husband, my husband's colleagues, and my friends from graduate school. So in the Ray Rice case, um, this was a good friend of mine, Diana Moskowitz, who left the Miami Herald to take a position at Deadspin in Los Angeles. She covered so many domestic violence cases when she was a reporter in South Florida that she wrote a story that went completely viral on, after the Ray Rice domestic violence incident when she was just talking about the culture of domestic violence. I assigned this to, Ray Rice happened. I, Mosky, I saw the story because she's one of my good friends. Uh, I assigned the story for required reading and then Mosky called into the class. I made sure, thanks to our brilliant SOC tech guys, that we could get a phone in the classroom and then she called in. And it was supposed to be a 30 minute discussion that turned into an hour. Students were dying to hear from her. And you know what, all the things that I had been saying for the first few weeks of class, now all of a sudden, because this person on the other end in Los Angeles who has a byline online, it was like, oh my God, Margo, you're right, you're correct, you know? So I tell her, you know, now she's given me some validity as a professor because she said it, right? Exploit the people that you know. Right? If I were in SIS right now, and I knew somebody who were in France, I do have a good friend who works at Reuters, but who worked in any capacity, they would be calling into my class next week, or Skyping in, or Snapchat, I don't know. However they'd be coming into my class, they'd be coming in. So the other thing that I just want to say is to just empower your students. They are eager to talk and to understand their place in the world, and they are saturated, oversaturated with information. Not just news, information. That's where my media literacy and my media background can help them understand that what is news, what is information, what is misinformation, right? And to try to allow them to kind of see themselves in the, uh, you know, their place in the world and their place in the world with those current events, right? The divestment issue, that's a fascinating issue here on campus that I had students covering. Um, so that's it. So you have to figure it out, right? Because there's always, <laughs> there's always gonna be a next time. There's always going to be another huge story. And whatever that is, you've got to figure out how to incorporate it in so you can be ready for the next time. So, okay. Thanks. So as we switch over to Molly, don't forget to post your thoughts. I have one here from Mikey Mears. Mika? Hi. <laughs> She says, liberate students to create meaning in your course. I think that goes nicely with uh, Margo's point about empowerment. So thank you very much. Molly, you all set? Sure. Great. Um, I will go quickly so that we have some time for Q&A. I am um, new to AU and relatively new to teaching. So uh, rather than put myself out as an authority on how to do this, I thought I would maybe provide some rules of the road, mostly from my own trial and error, about what has worked and what hasn't worked um, in my class. There have been several times where uh, I wish I could kind of back out and start again because I didn't frame things the right way. So maybe by sort of sharing with you some of my mistakes and also some things that, 
that did go well, it can help you think about how to how to use current events in um, uh, in your own classroom. Is my clicker going to work? Yeah. Oh, great. Okay. So this is just um, for me. I thought this was a little motivational in that a lot of students here at AU and certainly when I was a student are rabid consumers of news and current events and they love it and they breathe it and they think you know they could spend all of their time talking about it but there are a lot of students for whom this that that isn't um, uh, kind of their um, their motivation as a student and and I, I like to see this um, uh, quote from a student who talks about having current events um, integrated in her history class as being kind of she says the biggest effect in terms of engaging me in news compared to anything else I'd ever experienced. And so I think you know this can be a really important window of opportunity for students where they really are going to be engaged as kind of active citizens or not. And um, you know undergrad and graduate years, as we know, are the formative time to be able to do that. So really doing this well, I think, has the potential to have lifelong um, effects on our, on our students. This probably seems like the most obvious point in the world, use current events to make class material and curriculum relevant and tangible. I teach research methodology, and my students usually come into class completely you know, petrified that they're going to have to learn statistics and run a regression analysis, and they are going to have to do those things. But I try and use current events to bridge the gap between the science that's a little intimidating to them and what they want to know and what they want to explore. So when I give them you know, weekly reading on um, questionnaire design or how to write a survey, I ask them for their reaction paper to their readings to not necessarily just talk about the readings, but to talk about a current event or an example of what's something that you would want to do a survey about um, that's happened in the, you know, what's happening that you would want to do a survey about or find an example of a, of a survey. And, um, one of my students wrote a reaction paper on um, on questionnaire designs um, on how he would want to explore kind of the issue of racial profiling, Trayvon Martin, Ferguson. It sparked a really interesting conversation in our class because we had a difficult time as a class defining some of those concepts, operationalizing what is the what is racial profiling? How would you explain that in the context of a survey? Realizing that if the 20 of us in the classroom couldn't agree on it, it's awfully hard to then measure and test these complex um, uh, concepts. And so it sort of presented the situation, um, while they all kind of knew the basic facts, it presented a lot more complexity to it that I think was really, um, really interesting and really helpful for them. Um, allowing students the flexibility to choose their own examples and also to choose their own sources. I come from, you know, a very conventional news source, news, um, I guess, uh, uh, appetite where I, I, you know, I'm looking at the New York Times and the Washington Post and all the, um, all, all the kind of mainstream uh, media. My students, some of them are doing that and some of them aren't. I think what's really helpful is to not force them to look at specific sources, but to encourage them to keep up with things that are relevant to them. Um, and um, so both the sources as well as the topics um, being uh, very flexible. Not surprisingly, I have a lot of students in my program who um, this fall just all they wanted to talk about was the midterm elections. And did you see the debate and the North Carolina Senate race? And can we talk about that for half an hour in class? And <coughs> that's great. But I have other students who really aren't interested in electoral issues. And they want, they really follow things around energy and the environment very closely. And so being open to kind of using a variety of examples and again, a variety of sources, I think then doesn't impose a structure on the students that then you know, feels more like it's in a, an assignment rather than encouraging them to pursue their own interests. Uh, <clears throat> that said, I don't want to contradict this, but I, I think that it sometimes can be helpful, I learned this through the course of the semester, to post a link or a video on Blackboard where everybody has read the same thing before they come to class. So everybody thinks that they've read a lot about a specific incident, but what I found out is that they don't always come with the same kind of fact set. And so being able to start the discussion with everyone having the same foundation or knowledge 
it's fine if they've done you know extra reading and know lots of other things and of course they do but to make sure that everyone's at least starting the dialogue in a place where we have kind of a level of agreement instead of talking past each other right from the very beginning so doing that a day or two before class and telling students you know you're responsible for having read that or having watched that video or that news segment before you come um, uh, really helped and then this is my final point and um, <laughs> this is one of those uh, uh, things where I got into it and then wished I could have backed out and set the ground rules all over again and it, it, it kind of surprises me that I didn't think of doing this I, I moderate focus groups or did in um, a past life and one of the things you try and do knowing that it's a, a topic or a discussion is going to be difficult is to acknowledge that at the outset and to really ask students to respect that and to recognize that having that short one or two minute conversation with students before you dive into something can just be really helpful in letting everyone's guard down um, also I mean something I know I was trained to do as a focus group moderator is if I see that there's you know one or two students who really are backing away from the conversation to really try and draw them in to make sure that they're not feeling kind of uncomfortable, that they have a view, um, that they don't feel safe expressing. So having that kind of open, explicit agreement that we are going to be talking about things that people have different feelings about, and let's um, be able to do that in a way that's respectful and maybe even agree that this conversation stays in the room for learning purposes, and we're not going to, you know, kind of go across campus and then talk about this wild thing that was said um, in class. And the final thing in terms of um, trying to explore sensitive and controversial topics, knowing that <laughs> a lot of my students line up on the same side of something um, or see something from a similar perspective is to assign them different roles. So for example, um, I asked students in the um, Edward Snowden case, we were talking about um, uh, national security and, and, um, and um, those kinds of um, issues and I asked students okay so if you were going to be doing research on this topic and want to know what Americans think if the ACLU was your client who would you think are the important stakeholders to talk to and what are the concepts that you'd want to test and get at and now if the NSA is your client how are the stakeholders different or how do you want to approach the research differently remembering that you know good research should be neutral and unbiased, but you are coming at it from that different set of stakeholders and different set of concepts that are important. So having making those kinds of assignments um, allows students to, uh, allows there to be more of a diversity of discussion, even if you're kind of assigning those roles to promote that, that diversity, it creates more of a conversation. So with that, I just want to make sure we've got some time for, for questions. Oh, for me. Okay, great. <laughs> Um, so we're almost to Q and A, and I'm gonna Nicole. It's such a small picture. I'm, like, I'm trying to guess who everyone is on my phone. Um, um, you said using current events to teach history through digital media brings diversity to the classroom, and that's a lot about what I'm gonna talk about. So thank you for bringing that in. So um, I'm gonna go over some points about how to integrate current events into your classroom. I teach in political or political public communications. And uh, my background is very, very about the current. First of all, I, I studied rural sociology at a time when the urban population surpassed the number of people who lived in rural areas. My dissertation was on the GED the year before. The GED completely radically changed it. So I tell my students, like, if you're going to go to higher ed, do it the way I did. You know? I do applied history as it happens. <laughs> um, so uh, I was also the student, I went to an ag school, my friends are all very great scientists, I have some astrobiology friends, I was their friend who told them about what was going on in Us Weekly. So <laughs> I still do that in my classes, I teach a class called Common Society, I also teach research methods classes. Um, most of the case studies here come from my Common Society class, uh, it is a gen ed class, um, but I do, do integrate this in um, other of my classes. Um, so first of all, I allow for flexibility in my classroom. Uh, especially in common society, and I taught an undergrad advertising class, I have about five to 10 minutes every class that I allow students to talk about the news. It can be new or good, it can be something that they just found out about. Um, and you'll be surprised to find out that they will talk about stuff 
that you never thought that they would be interested in. But this should apply to any of the classes you teach. Does anyone know what this is? This is a picture from the Rosetta mission that happened. So how many people teach in the sciences? So this is, na I mean, international news. This is the first ESA mission that they did something that surpassed what NASA did. They're following, they're trailing the comet. Um, something that you can talk about uh, first thing. Um, you know, we think about geology, astrobiology as things that happen really far away, but this is news. Um, we talked about the NFL, and this is uh, Texas uh, Presbyterian the Hospital in Dallas. Uh, not only did we talk about Ebola and new and good, we also talked about how the hospital was covering uh, what was going on. So we'd go at that moment in the new and good section and go check their Twitter feed. So what is the hospital saying with the, the patient from Dallas? <clears throat> it's also a good opportunity for you to drop your assumptions. Don't assume you know what's important to students. I learned this from my science friend. I was like, the pixies are having a reunion tour? I don't even know who that is, right? So I had to drop my assumptions. Um, so how I do this is I let my students report the news. I have, and you can follow this, it's public. I have uh, for my uh, Common Society class, hashtag Com 209 I encourage them to report any news. I'm non-judgmental. I had anything from Alex from Target if anyone remembers what happened there, they were really into Alex from Target. They figured out, uh, you know, they figured out that it was a marketing ploy. Um, but they did through the course of, especially like this Alex from Target kid's huge. And then two weeks ago, two weeks later, they're like, actually, it's a marketing ploy. I don't know. Okay. Um, this is one of my students uh, posting about uh, the midterm elections. The student's actually an international student, so it was really great to see that she was following the news in America and. I had really high uh, political literacy about this. Yuli mentioned something here about the, the J Jerusalem synagogue uh, attack, and she actually asked a question to the class. Should news outlets show these bloody images that weren't doing that? That's not me. That's them talking to each other. So that when I get into the class, I can, and then for the new and good session, when they're quiet, and oftentimes they'll be quiet, I'll say, well, just like I did in this session, Philippe brings up an interesting point, or let's talk a little bit from Alex from Target. Let's talk about Renee Zellweger. I mean, these sound really insignificant in the scope of things, but when you can talk about Renee Zellweger was, I don't know if you know this, this was spotted and she had a dramatically different look. So we talked about gender and celebrity and what it means for gender studies. And it's very important. And it's something that they noticed and they brought to my attention. But, as much as your students have interests that might not be what you're interested in, don't lose sight on what's important. Um, and you have to figure out ways to adapt your lectures for breaking news. Um, so when Ray Rice, the second video drops in the fall, I did a pause and I said, there are just sometimes things that happen in the news that are too important that I can't not talk about. So we're gonna talk about it today. And how I did this particular activity um, was I focused on two things, having structure while you talk about it and focusing on discovery of context, not lecturing. So how I did this was I did an activity that we went through the three big events with the Ray Rice story. First, the actual event. Second, the release of the first video. And second, the release of the second video. I didn't tell them when any of these happened. I told them to take out their laptop and find the story around these events. And then they built the context around that. So that focused on discovery. It wasn't my lecturing saying, well, they were in a casino um, on Valentine's Day weekend, and apparently this is what happened. I don't, I, I don't follow the, the story to that extent. I don't have this background when it comes to breaking news. I want them to come to me and tell me. So they went and they found the story from, I believe it was the Baltimore Sun, and they went through and told me what happened. And then they could see how the media built the story from Ray Rice and his wife were released from the police. It doesn't seem like that big of a story. To the second video, which ended up being, you know, should we deal with Roger Goodell as commissioner of the NFL? Um, I'm also focusing on, in my classes, how to turn lecture and context, things that we think are historical, into action. And that's my background when I was an undergrad. I did a lot of things in student activism. And when I sat in a class and I was learning about farm workers, I was like, cool, how do I go integrate service learning with farm workers? 
So I want to teach those kind of skills to my students. And it can be very, very, maybe in, you know, almost small, but to them it's very, very large. So first thing, you, you can integrate with existing campus events. Uh, Professor Jane Hall had a, an event with Chris Saliza where she was soliciting students um, what was important to them for the midterm elections. So for one class, we did um, an activity where students wrote down what was important to them. So we have things like human rights, same-sex marriage, can't read what Lily has, diversity, gender equality. And this was actually pretty incredible. This was an inception pick stitch, or doing a pick stitch within a pick stitch within a pick stitch, which I really enjoyed when I said that. If you don't know what pick stitch is, it's great. Um, so these are all the pictures we took. Um, from that, Charlotte, um, who I believe was interested in the cost of uh, college being too high, was actually chosen to ask the first question at the event. And here's her tweet when she went to the event. So we went from a classroom activity where we're talking about why millennials don't vote, what's interesting to you, to the actual, she's asking Chris Saliza, who knows a lot more about political science than I do, um, what he thinks is that's going to be the impact of the midterm election. Uh, global is local, and you can use social media to make your world even smaller. Does anyone know who this is? Well, in my hometown, they released some public art right when the semester started. Um, this is for Common Society. I believe that public art is part of the milieu of communication. Nothing happened like this in DC, but this was a big deal in Buffalo. This is uh, um, the Erie County Commissioner. This is the mayor of Buffalo. I don't know who that guy is. Um, actually, I think that's the the. Albright Knox had, uh, he's the head of the art museum. This is a big PR thing that happened the first week of class. Um, as it was happening, people in Buffalo started a satirical account called At Charcoal Buffalo, where she was actually, you were encouraged to take selfies with her. She would talk back. Um, she had a friend <laughs> called Largemouth Bass Girl. It became like actually a real big thing. Now she actually, <coughs> has, the, the satirical account has 919 followers. The artist herself um, only had a handful. Uh, so she actually started an account herself. So in the actual class, we talked about public art and we tweeted Shark Girl. Hey Shark Girl, what's up? We wanted to figure out, was Shark Girl Buffalo actually being run by the museum or is it being run by the artist or was it really, in fact, some person in Buffalo who was bored? running um, Shark Girl Buffalo. But the idea behind this was, what does public art mean? So at the end, we had this conversation that, hey, isn't it neat that back in the day, this was it, right? You had the conversation with art. Now you're actually literally can have the conversation with someone who's Shark Girl. What does that mean to us? And as public communicators, what does that mean for the places we market? Um, why should we have policies that fund public art? and all sorts of issues like this. Um, I teach a lot about free speech. That shouldn't be too much of a surprise in com communication in society. Um, partner with existing institutions, leave the classroom, and actually act. So Bad Book Week is, some, I think, sometime in November. Um, you probably received an email from the library and said if you want to read something. Um, I actually asked the library if I could bring my class. I let the students pick the book. Uh, Harry Potter was the most banned book of the last 10 years. Um, they picked Harry Potter. Uh, this is actually this uh, YouTube from reading the last book. They all, I had them all take the stage. They all signed a waiver. They all volunteered. Anyone who's in here volunteered to do this as an act of participating, excuse me, in free speech. So that's one way you can do it. The, the other, the last way, I teach research methods as well. Um, I focused my class last semester on gender industry, or gen lack of gender diversity in industry, um, issues around lean in, et cetera, et cetera. I had an all woman class. I had 100% females in my class. Mm -hmm. um, so I actually designed the final project to make students be experts. So they retained clients in different areas. This one, um, they worked with the Paleontological Society, so having a friend who was a scientist paid off for me to actually have a client in the end. Um, they also partnered with Women in Film and Video DC. These are two industries that classically have lack gender diversity. They wrote these reports. They became experts. They presented to clients. And what's interesting about that is, you know, as much as I can be the professor, it's my responsibility to guide them through the way. So 
they now know more about these issues than I do. And I think that's really important for them, for their portfolio, and for you know the industry as you move forward. So to summarize, be flexible, drop assumptions, adapt to current events, and try to, as much as you can, turn context into action. So now is a good time for questions. I know we sped it up a little bit, but feel free to ask any of us any questions. We have the front page photo with the bloody body, mm -hmm. and not many people voted. Um, I think a couple people said yes, run it. I said no, don't. But there was no discussion. I'd like to hear the discussion. <laughs> so if it were my class, you would have seen a number of, of ang I guess angles or different front pages. Um, so you would have. Mm -hmm we would have had some discussion of it. So I appreciate the, the person who said like, what is that a picture of? Um, it would have been really big you know, in the classroom. But um, so, you know, what are your thoughts? I would run it. And, okay. um, and I, I think I was maybe the only person who raised my hand in saying that. Well, and um, I'm the director of the photography program at FOC. And the reason why I would run it is Michael Ducio, who just passed away, Pulitzer Prize winning photographer for the Washington Post, said that this is reality, this is what's there, and how else are you, you're, you're, as a photographer, you're there, you're supposed to shoot what you see, and how else can you impact, I mean, this is this is what actually happened. So. And I think, what, and I just wanna say what I would, in class, the next photo I would show would be of um, a young man, his last name is Bauman, Aaron Bauman, who, uh, a photo of him with his, uh, his, is it your femur? Yeah. This bone sticking out? Um, both of his legs are lost. Um, that would be the next photo that you would see in my class. And then I would say, okay, are we also going to show that and photo? Then I would say run that too. In, in, you know, and then that yeah. just launches into a discussion yeah. of you know what's what's appropriate, what's not. When students see graphic images, um, they you know, and I always think that they're more drawn to that just so they can click through. They're so used to violence and gore. John. I'm, I'm, I'm curious, would it have made a difference to you if the bloody victim on the ground <coughs> survived or not? Because that's why I abstained. I didn't know if that was One of a casualty, things. fatal casualty or not. It's a good question. I'm actually not sure either. I would need to double check which front Because I was think which. I would not have run it if, if it were a fatality, okay. but I'm not positive I could put words yeah. to the distinction. Like, you know, this, this, <laughs> this, there was a, a photo five, would yeah. let me go into the article to okay. find out the information, right? right? So if I'm drawn into the image, then I want to find out what else is happening there. Like, what is that? Victor's telling me one story, the article yeah, yeah. is going to tell me but more. So I would be a rule in newspapers that you generally didn't run a dead body. But well, a lot so of that right. changed right. before, not before Obama. I saw your hand up. Yeah, I mean, I was just gonna say, in terms of like, you know, making these teachable moments, I, I, I mean, in some, uh, in, at least in journalism with photography, like the way that we uh, saw these images changed a lot after Vietnam, and there was actually a policy change that happened after Vietnam. Um, and so like, I wonder how much you also include the concept that the whole part of like historical and, and how like our current expectations of, of these images and what uh, how we see violence represented is, is also shaped by the, the historical period in which we're in and also by the policies that we're kind of that a lot of people don't know about um, within broadcasting of the mass comm. Well, I mean, one of the st one of the things after Newtown, and I remember getting up and lecturing on Newtown. My daughter was uh, a year old. Mm -hmm. It was a very powerful story for me. I'm sure and for everyone. But crying in front of my class, my ethics class, like could not speak. I was so overcome with emotion. I mean, it was like, how am I going to get through this lecture? Um, but showing, um, using the example of Emmett Till, when his mother chose yeah. to run the open casket photo and show it uh, around the, you know, around the country, would something change if a Newtown victim's parent allowed a open casket photo of their child? You know, that that was a pretty fascinating discussion. I think that. Students in this generation are so inundated with images of violence and gore and grand theft, or you can beat someone to death and kill someone, that um, 
I don't really think it would make. But see, I think that's very Western. Like, I'm from Guatemala, and like, well, the, yeah. So it's it's very Alma's Western. Birthday, I mean, yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, we expect it, and when our media doesn't show that, we're like, what is going on? You know what I mean? So I think it's that whole Western concept of the media is kind of like a parent in a way, or watches out for like. I mean, it's very Western. Agree with you, right? So and, and I and I say that my classes. I mean, we we discuss that that unfortunately <coughs> don't have time to talk about worldwide. I mean, we. I mean, media is like we talk about like how media is like this like internal thing. Agree with you. Agree with you. Agree with you. Uh, I mean, unfortunately, if I had two full years, I would do every. I would do the massacres of Elizabeth Day. I would do every you know every story. What last question? I think maybe we have time for one more. Yeah, we have another question. Yeah, yeah. Okay. Yeah. 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 Yeah.